Hey guys, I'm Jim Richards. I want to welcome you to this message in this series, Resurrection Realities. And today we are going to be talking about putting on the life of Christ. Now, one of the things you've got to realize when you think about putting on a new life, which is what we're doing, we're not, you know, God has not called you to polish up the old life. He hasn't called you to clean up the old life. He hasn't called you to make you know, sacrificial improvements to your old life. He does not want you to just be the best you you can be. Uh, he wants everything outside of life in Christ to be totally eradicated, to be totally done away with, because you can't live two lives at the same time. You, you can't be made righteous by the Lord Jesus Christ and still have a sinful nature. You know, that's one of the craziest things that, uh, that, that most of religion teaches. They teach that, uh, that you get saved, you still have a sinful nature. No, you don't. If you still have a sinful nature, you didn't get saved. It's just, it's just that simple. God wants to give you a new life. Matter of fact, listen to this over in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This is one of the very first scriptures I ever memorized after I got born again. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Man, so this simple scripture right here, which I'm going to read more of in just a moment, makes it very clear. Everything, everything that's old has passed away. Everything that is old has died. The idea is you come to Jesus and you give up every aspect of that life, everything that you have come to believe, everything you've learned. And you say, okay, God is my creator. Jesus is my Lord. The Holy Spirit is my teacher. The Bible is my truth. And so now I am going to discover life uh, as a new creation. I'm going to discover, and I'm leaving all of that behind. I'm not going to drag it forward. You know, when people get born again and they ha- you know, they're always having trouble and they're always having counseling and all that kind of stuff, it's just because they keep trying so you don't forget that you don't forget everything you experienced in the old life. But if you if you are putting on Christ, if you're if you're yielding to the process of reconciliation, then then what starts happening is you start seeing the total fallacy of everything about your old life, the total fallacy and the total corruption, the total deceit about everything that the world system has to offer, and and you step into something brand new because that has no appeal to you. But you see, when we don't find out who God is, when we don't discover the truth about God, we don't discover how good God is, then we hold on to those things from our past, thinking that's the only way we can get the kind of fulfillment that we got. Well, that may be true to some degree, but that kind of fulfillment always brings death, destruction, pain, and suffering on emotional, physiological, relational, and spiritual levels. So, God wants to make everything new. He doesn't want you struggling about anything from your past, and you only struggle with it if you hold on to it and you try to bring it forward into this new life. So it goes on to say, it says, now all things, uh, one, one translation says, all these things are of God, all these things that have become new, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So now, remember, we've discovered that the word reconciliation would have probably been better translated in modern English as exchange, because it is an exchange. It is two entities that actually totally and completely change places. It's like it's like purchasing something. It's like buying something back where somebody has a product that you want and you have the money they want. And when you give them the money, they give you the product and you walk away with a product, but you don't take any of the money with them because it is an exchange. It is a purchase. It is a buying back it is a trading of places, if you will. And so God has bought us back and he has done this through the Lord Jesus Christ, very specifically through the reconciliation or the exchange that took place between us and Jesus. If in fact, we heard the truth, believe the truth, and, and gave ourselves to that truth. So verse 19 says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and committed to us the word of reconciliation. That's what preaching the gospel is all about. Everything from 
getting born again, to getting healed, to getting delivered, to getting set free from poverty, all, all of those things occur in the exchange because Jesus had all these things and we didn't have all of these things. And so we made an exchange where we took the life that he had as the resurrected Lord. He took the life that we had as a struggling sinner. Now, I'm just going to throw this in and kind of put in a little, little parentheses here. Many people believe that since Jesus reconciled the, wor the world to himself, that everybody's automatically saved. That is absolutely not true. There is not any place in the Bible where you can get any concept of having salvation apart from personal faith in the resurrected Lord and Savior. But, uh, but here's what is important to understand. Uh, Jesus paid for the life of every person. In other words, when, when somebody gets born again, Jesus doesn't have to die again. He doesn't have to go through all the again because on the cross, he became the sins of the world. He took, he took on the sins of every single person and he suffered the consequences of every single person. And he, and he won the battle over all those consequences and was raised from the dead. So, you know, when I talk to people about the love of God, it's like, look, God's already paid for this. God's not waiting to see what you're going to do. He's already paid for it, but you haven't entered into it yet. You enter into it when you believe he's paid for it. You enter into it when you trust what Jesus has done. So he says in verse 20, he says, he says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. And we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled or to enter into the exchange with God uh, for he, well, let me just stop there for a minute. So so you see, it's one thing for God to have freely given us something and everything we need for life and godliness, everything we need for joy and peace, everything that we need has already been freely given to us. The issue is not, will God do this for me? The question is not, will God give this to me? The question is, will I believe it and enter into it? And that's, that's our choice. Now, God's a God of love, and because he's a God of love, he never makes you do anything. He never forces you to a decision. You know, he's given you the truth of his word, and you can either read it, believe it, or not. Uh, but it is always your choice as to whether you will stay where you are, you will stay in the messed up life that you're in, or you will make a decision to trust God and enter into this exchange through the Lord Jesus Christ. So then verse 21 becomes very, very interesting because verse 21 says, for he, that's God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, I'm just going to tell you this right here is one of the most controversial concepts in all of Christianity, which, by the way, let me just say this. I hate the word Christianity. God never called us Christians. The, you know, we were referred to as Christians by believers who basically were mocking us. And the real truth is you're either a believer, you're a disciple, you're a son, you're an heir, you're a joint heir. But, you know, the word Christian doesn't really mean anything. So I, I hate even using that word. I only use that word because that's what people, what people relate to. But in all of Christianity, uh, if, you really want, if you really want to get people fired up, start talking about this passage of Scripture as if it's true, because it is true. So, you see, God is a just, moral God. He's not an angry God. He is not, he's not out to get you. He is out to save you. He's out to find a way to deliver you. He's out to give you the very best life possible. And so, so he has taken care of everything. He's paid the price for everything. And, and the way he did this, because he is just, that all sins have to suffer the consequences. But you see, God did not create us to suffer the consequences. God created us to be a part of his family. God created us to enter into an eternal relationship with him where we live the best quality of life, not only the best quality of life imaginable, but really a quality of life that is beyond anything that anybody has ever imagined. It's going to be it. Right now, we can experience glimpses of it right here on earth, 
in our heart as we live in peace and joy inwardly, no matter what's going on outside of us. But I'm telling you, uh, when we enter into this fully, it will just be beyond anything we could ever conceive. So, so since sin, the, the penalty or the price of sin had to be paid for, see, God cannot, and he says he can't because of, because of justice, he can't just, ah, oh, you know what, we're going to let that go. So, okay, so you murdered somebody and God's just going to let that go? No, justice says uh, if you murdered, then you, the price you pay should be death. Justice says that if you stole, the price that you pay should be, uh, what is it, six, seven times the amount that you stole. Justice says that whatever you seek to do to anybody or try to do to anybody, even if you don't get by with it, that is the penalty that you should pay. And so, in his, because God is fair, because God is just, it would totally violate his justice. It would be totally unjust to the victims of the world for God to say, hey, you know what? We're just going to let it go. I mean, you know, I know those people burned your kids alive in that house that burned down. I'm, you know, I know that, I know that you shot, you know, and, you know, a bunch of people in the head and you know, yada, yada, yada. But, you know, we're just going to let it go because I'm merciful. That is not mercy. That is lawlessness. That is the rejection of God's justice. So, so here's the deal. I don't want to pay for my, for, for my sins. And honest truth is God doesn't want me to pay for my sins. God wants to deliver me. He wants to, he wants to pour his mercy and his goodness out on us in such a way that, that when we die to that life and when all of that life dies and we are raised up in newness of life, we immediately uh, fall deeply in love with God, we immediately start to recognize and trust the love of God because we are experiencing it. But still, all of those, all of those sins and transgressions to satisfy justice had to be paid. So Jesus becomes a man. He's the son of God. He empties himself. He's still the son of God, but he doesn't walk around planet Earth exhibiting any of the powers of the son of God, everything that he did, he did as a man filled with the Holy spirit. He lived a sinless life. He ministered to people. He showed us what the love of God looks like. But then on the cross, when he hang on the cross, God, and the Bible is very clear about this. God caused him to become our sin. Now, I'm going to just tell you what I have been preaching this for 49 years. And there, there's a part of me that can gr internally grasp the reality of this, but there's absolutely no way I can intellectually explain it to anybody's satisfaction. But I do know this, if Jesus had not become my sin and had not paid my price, then I would have to pay the price for that sin. And there would be no one to deliver me from that sin. So Jesus becomes sin, and, and he dies the death that we deserve. He goes into the grave. He is bound. Uh, he is actually bound in Hades, uh, where people who do not have faith, where they die, alienated from God, because that's all part of the price that we would have had to pay. There's not one aspect of the price or the consequences that we would have to pay for that Jesus didn't pay for, because if he didn't pay for the slightest part of it, he didn't pay for it, then we would have to go do what he did. We would have to go die for that sin. We would, we would have to be alienated from God. We would have to trust God to raise us, you know, from the depths of Hades. And the truth is not many of us would probably ever be able to make that journey. So the fact that Jesus became my sin, took all my punishment, and, and actually conquered that sin, and we'll get into more of that later. That means that I have the chance to be reconciled. I have the chance to enter into an exchange. So Jesus paid that price. He was raised up in righteousness. He conquered sin. Uh, and so I have the chance, now that Jesus has been raised from the dead, to say, you know what? Let's swap. What I'm, I'm, I'm going to swap is since you have already paid for all of my sins, I am going to, in my heart, accept the fact that I died with you on that cross, because what you died from was my sins. It was my sins that killed you. You died from that, so I'm entering into that with you, 
and I'm and I am going into the grave with you, but I am also coming up out of the grave with you in righteousness. So Jesus said, look, we'll make a swap. I will take all of your sin and I will pay the price for it. You will take all of my righteousness and get all the benefits from it. Man, that's the message of exchange. That's the message of reconciliation. Now, the Bible talks about this in dozens and dozens of places. It uses different terminology. One of my very favorite places that the Bible talks about this is in Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40 is, is a passage of scripture that, that talks about us exchanging our weakness with God's strength. So this is all through the Old Testament. This is all through the New Testament. It has always been God's plan. This was not a secondary plan. When God created the human race, he was ready and willing to make this incredible sacrifice for us to have eternal life. Isaiah 40 says, that those who wait upon the Lord shall renew. Well, that word renew in the Hebrew is exchange. Those who wait upon the Lord, the word wait upon the Lord is not like I'm going to wait and see if you show up, not I'm here and you're not, you need to get here, not I'm early, you're late. That word wait means to entwine or wrap yourself around something to such a degree that, that the two things become one. And this is what happens to people who enter into reconciliation. We become one with Jesus in such a way that we don't walk around feeling guilty because of all of our past sins and failures. We walk around with the sense that this has all been paid for. This debt has been settled. God's not mad at me. And anybody out here in the world is mad at me. I can understand it if I hurt them, if I violated them. But the real truth is I, this debt has been paid. And also, since Jesus has been raised up in righteousness and received an, an inheritance of the kingdom of God, I have that, I, I'm wrapped around him. So I have that sense that the inheritance he received is the same inheritance I received, that the righteousness that he has is actually the same righteousness that I have. In other words, everything, everything that he suffered is like I suffered that with him and it all died, the debt is settled. Everything that he obtained it's like I receive that with him and in him. So I don't lack for anything. And, and the key then is I've got to know how to access that. And, and we'll, we'll get more into that. You know, Isaiah 53 uh, is, uh, is a scripture that even the Hebrews don't like to read. Most Hebrews won't read this scripture because it very specifically talks about what Jesus did on the cross. And it says in verse one, it says, who's believed our report? Well, you know, that's really the, the, the question everybody's got to answer. Do you believe God's report about creation? Do you believe God's report about the creation of the human race? Do you believe God's report about what Jesus did, about him dying and being raised? The, whose report do you believe? Do you believe God's report? Do you believe religion's deport, report? Do you believe uh, political reports? Do you, know, uh, do you believe uh, Lucifer's lies that, are, that are, have and filtrate it the, the entire earth. He says, he says, he should, talking about Jesus, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root of dry ground, and he has no form or comeliness. And when you see him, there's no beauty that you should desire him. In other words, you know, Jesus is not going to come with a light shining behind his head and a little halo back there. So you go, oh, oh, oh there's Jesus. No, uh, it, it just says he's just going to be like everybody else. And and, uh, and, and of course, as such, he is going to show us exactly what any person can do, how they can function if they uh, allow the Holy Spirit to minister through them and touch people in the world. So in verse three, it says, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him and he was despised and we did not esteem him. So this word, by the way, these, these words, sorrows, grief, and sorrows, these words actually get into physical and emotional sickness and affliction. So it's saying that Jesus took every sickness, every disease, every emotional and mental and physical affliction. He took that. And why did he take it? Well, it tells you why he takes it. He takes it says, surely he has borne our grief. He didn't bear his grief. He didn't. You know, he had never sinned. He didn't, he wasn't suffering for anything that he did. 
It says he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. In other words, this is the first half of the exchange. This is where our sin and rebellion and transgression and hate and murders and fornication. This is this is where it was. This is where the debt was paid because he carried these things. It says, "But we esteem him stricken uh, uh, and smitten by God and afflicted." It says, "But he was wounded for our transgressions; he was bruised for our iniquities." So again, this gets back into the fact that everything that he went through, whether it was a physical suffering, whether it's what he suffered emotionally or spiritual, every bit of that was in fact uh, uh, done so that we would not have to do that. And so it says. Uh, the chastisement for our peace was upon him. You know, the minute somebody talks about, starts telling you that what you're going through is chastisement, because keep in mind, the Bible does say God chastises us, but you know, every now and then, it wouldn't hurt somebody to look up a word in the original language, because when the Bible talks about God chastises us, that word chastise means to child train and the way you would child train and develop a child that you favor. This word for chastisement is that brutal, harsh thing. In other words, in other words, he suffered every aspect of chastisement for us. But what's interesting is, a, but the chastisement for our peace was upon him. That's why we can enter in peace. See, he took he took our punishment. We take the peace because we know that the debt has absolutely been settled. It says, um, and by his stripes we are healed. Well, in, in the Hebrew here, as well as in the Greek New Testament. This is the word bruising, because it just said he was bruised for our iniquities. This has nothing to do with the stripes of the Roman soldiers that they put on Jesus' back. This has to do with the bruising from our iniquities, the bruising uh, uh, from our transgressions, the chastisement that he suffered so that we would never have to suffer. And it says in verse six, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity is all. In the Hebrew, that says that the Lord calls the, the iniquity of all of us to violently rush upon him. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of this. You, you can go through here and read this, but you start understanding something. If Jesus was, was able to die, then that meant that sin actually had to take hold of him. Well, how could sin take hold of him if he was sinless? Well, he was sinless until he became our sin. Now, people struggle with this. I get it. I understand it. Probably some of you are going to be mad at me, you know, what I'm about to say. You know, this sounds very much like God is saying that Jesus literally became our sin, which means he died the death of the sinner, which meant he went to the abode of the sinner. And we're going to, we're going to talk about how he entered into resurrection and entered into newness of life. But there's another key. If, if he had not become our sin, why would he need newness of life? And so this gets into stuff that religious people don't want to talk about. Religious minds don't want to talk about. But the reality of it is Jesus died. He died the death of a sinner. Sin held him in the grave. But here's the key, and this is, this is going to be so crucial. I'm telling you, this is your chance to enter into a level of victory, enter into a level of being an overcomer that you never imagined. We read last week that if we wanted to come to this place where all things would actually work together for our good, and this is not where something goes bad and you say, well, I guess God did it for a good reason. No, that is so stupid. It's just beyond sensibilities. You know, uh, God is not trying to punish you. If he tries to punish you for your sin, then he is rejecting what Jesus did for you. He is denying what Jesus accomplished by taking the punishment first. There's got to be some place where Jesus becomes the focal point of our Christianity. And the truth is, if you believe that, you see who God is, and you fall in love with God, you won't have a sin problem. A lot of people say, well, you know, if people believe that, they'll just get by with everything. Well, you know, something people do get by with a lot of stuff and messes up their life. There are consequences in their life. But God has made it where people don't have to do that. They can have this, in, this incredible life. But we read that if you, want, if you want to come to that place where everything works out for your good, two, there are two factors. Number one is entering into this completely loving, this perfect love 
where God is pouring his love on you, you're receiving it, you're feeling it, you're enjoying it, and it's causing you to love him right back and to love everything that, that he loves. That's what perfect love is. It's a, it's a love that accomplishes the goal for which it was given. So uh, that's the first aspect of it. But the second aspect of it is that we have to participate or be jointly transformed into the likeness of Jesus. Now, you read a scripture like that, and you don't understand that Jesus became sin, and that in order for him to come up out of that grave, he had to go through a transformation. And I, don't, I can't say that I understand it. I can't say that I can explain it in ways that you'll fully understand. I am saying it is in the Bible. And, and you know, you might be a Christian. And I don't know what that means, but I'm asking you, are you a believer? Do you believe the word of God? Do you believe very specifically what Jesus did, what he accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection? And if he didn't, you call your Christian, yourself a Christian all along. It doesn't mean anything. We want to be believers so that we, as through believing in our heart, that we enter into this exchange. And we free ourselves from all the shame, all the guilt, all the past. And really, we enter into this resurrection life by going through a transformation with him, just like we died with him and just like we're raised up with him. Well, between that death and between being raised up, there was a transformation. And I am telling you, I've been cussed and literally cussed to the dirt by preachers, by deacons, by believers when I start talking about Isaiah 53. Do you know what? Read it for yourself. So listen, we will get it. We will step into this father. I'm taking you one step at a time. I'm hoping that every week you're going through every bit of this, you're absorbing this, you're pondering it, you're meditating, you're looking up scriptures, you're doing your own research to understand, is this what the Bible says? Don't go try to disprove me. I mean, you can if you want to, but if you want to disprove me, you'll find some justification. Go try to see if this is really what the Bible says. And you know what? Pop this video out, share it with other people, because I'm telling you what, people who are struggling get incredible help from a video like this. So. So do everything you can to share this with people. If you're watching this on YouTube, like it again. And if you got questions or comments, be sure and post them. And we're going to do everything we can to help you with it. Also, be sure if you want to explore other, other aspects of the gospel, go to drjimrichards.com or go to impactministries.com. We've got all hundreds of free videos that you can watch that will help you develop your life. So, all right, be ready. Be ready to take another step forward. I will be talking to you next week.